Well, the frozen chosen, that's about as much uh, heaven as you're going to get. Huh? I saw you some, some of you bobbing your heads along with that Thank you, choir. Last week we started a new sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit that we entitled The Evidence That God Is at Work in Your Life. As we started out with understanding that God has called us as the church and as the body of Christ just to a different way of life. That we should look different than the world. We should act different than the world. And, and so often we're, we, we tend to compare ourselves to the world out there. That, well, out there they do, or out there they do this or that, whatever it might be. But for us, as the church and as Christians, the standard is not the world out there. The standard is Christ. It's always Christ. If, if we as the church look to anything else as our measuring stick, then we've, we've missed the point of faith. We've missed the point of what it means to belong to Jesus. You see, as the church, if we live with jealousy, we're envious, if we're divisive, if, if we lose sight of the kingdom, then we look no different than the world out there. For us, we're to walk by the Spirit. And so each week as we go through this series, we're going to remind ourselves of what the fruit of the Spirit is. And the fruit of the Spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Last week we were challenged from Galatians and from Paul to think about how we love one another, how we serve one another humbly in love. Because evidence that God is at work in our lives is that we will love one another and that we will love God. The next thing, evidence that God is at work in our lives, is that we, as children of the kingdom, as people of God, will live with joy. We open our Bibles this morning to the book of James, chapter 1, reading verses 2 through 4. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray this morning that you would fill us with joy. The joy of the kingdom. That we, as your people, would be joy givers instead of joy takers. Father, fill us with your spirit. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We live in a very fascinating time, an interesting time in the United States and in Western philosophy and history today. At least I, I think it is. It's fascinating because we live in a culture that has really, really challenged us to buy into the lie. You know, we, we look around, and we've been talking about this a lot lately, it's hard to ignore what's happening in our world. Is, is every year we have higher depression rates and suicide rates than the year before, and we have for the last 20 to 25 years. It, it, it really is a sort of mind-boggling thing. And I know I've mentioned it, but it's important that we keep that in front of us because we as the church have to ask ourselves this question. Why? Why is it that, that the world around us seems to be spiraling, in many ways, into despair and hopelessness? And this isn't the only thing, but I, I do think that this is part of it. We're in this very fascinating shift culturally and philosophically about morality in our culture, in our lives. It's been going on for about, since the 1950s, probably 1960s, going on for about 50 or 60 years now, this shift that we've been experiencing. And the church has sort of gotten caught up in the crosshairs. So there's really two ways, at least two things right now in our culture. And I know, settle in, I'm going to give you a philosophy lesson. So I know that's why you came here this morning. So, uh, But it's really important, I think, that we grasp this concept. Really, there's this, there's two kind of moral understandings or virtues in which our culture is trying to operate. And, and really, you're going to fall into one camp or the other right now in how the culture understands morality. You see, on one hand, we have uh, the Aristotle view of morality, which is that there are virtues. This is a philosophical understanding. It was all the way back to Aristotle, which is a long time ago, but most of Western 
history, and most of Christianity falls in this camp. And the camp is that there are values or virtues, a, a moral good, that we must try to attain. And so, whatever that might be, there are virtues that the church sets, and that, the fam that our family unit sets, or even the culture sets. So there are these ultimate good. And, and we know, deep down, that we actually, this is where people call us hypocrites, we know that, that we're not going to live by that all the time. But the, the goal is for us as people to strive to those particular goals. So we know that something can be good, or that is good, and we also know that we're ultimately going to fall short of that, right? And, and so uh, people that deal, you know, when we deal with our sin, and this is sort of the concept that that's falling under. We, we know, people know that they shouldn't cheat on their spouse, right? People know that, and yet people still do that. It still happens. So that, that's this philosophical understanding that there is a greater morality, something up here that we must try to attain. We will eventually fall short of it, but we are striving to live that way. Now, the, the, the idea, that idea, that concept for many people <laughs> means that we're kind of shackled and chained to this greater understanding of the culture, but at the same time, it's what allowed and still allows people to be opposite ends of a political spectrum because you as a culture share these values. We share these virtues. So we may disagree how we get to that particular value or that particular virtue, but everybody's going towards the same point. And so you can agree to disagree because we're still sort of working towards this overall communal understanding of what's good for the community. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there going, yeah, I, I agree with that. I like that way of understanding morality. Now, there's going to be a generational gap here. Now, don't take this, don't be offended, but chances are if you're over the age of 50 or 55, you're probably nodding in your head along going, yes, yeah, that's right, that's the way we should live. Now you're not going to admit it. You're all just kind of sitting there with smiles on your face. But it's true. Now, what we're, what's, what's fascinating, what's happening here, is that in America over the last 50 or so years, there's been a monumental shift into a different view. That, that the highest virtue or the highest value is not necessarily some set of moral standards that we're all trying to live by, but that the highest virtue is finding your authentic self, right? I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. Now, this comes to us, and it's always been sort of this competing value, but philosophically it comes to us from this guy named Jacques uh, Rousseau, who's a French philosopher, and, and Rousseau believed that the highest virtue that a human can live by is to find out who they really are. And so it's this striving to be really me. I am who I am. Sure, none of you have heard that phrase before. I am who I am. Now, in this philosophical shift in understanding, morality actually becomes this, this secondary value, the secondary virtue. You guys have some light. I'm thinking about this. Just stay with me. I have a point. Uh, the secondary virtue, because the overall driving virtue is I have to find out who I really am. So I have to be me. And if that's our driving virtue, then morality just becomes this, this secondary way of thinking about life. And so what's happening in the United States is sort of this monumental shift over the last 50 or 60 years to more of a Rousseau approach to life. I have to find my authentic self. And when I find my authentic self, and when I find out who I really am, I'm on a journey of self-discovery, then I will be happy. Then I will be joyful. And so we, we really, I think now, are starting to see the outcome of this philosophy. And, and I actually believe individual freedom and the Rousseau approach to life prizes individual freedom as the most uh, beneficial virtue. So that's the thing that we should be driving for the most. To me, that's where the problem is. Because it makes a moral understanding of life a secondary value. And so we have these sort of competing values in our culture, and, and we're, we're fighting between this or that, but this Rousseau approach to life, this authentic self, this, this find out who I really want to be, or, or find myself, actually makes us turn inward for all the problems we face. So the, the philosophical ideal is that, that it all can be found within me. And i got to tell you, sometimes when I look 
within me, I don't really like what I see. But if being my authentic self is the highest value by which I live by, then the only logical conclusion is that there's nothing wrong with me, so there just must be wrong with all of you. But you out there don't take it personally. It just It's the truth, because I'm just being me, right? Uh, it, you out there, then, are the problem. It must be everybody else, because there's nothing wrong with me or me being my authentic self. And then there's a, a second problem with this approach to life, and that it's lazy. What I mean by that is that we can explain away our sins, we can explain away our mistakes and our failures and our vulgarities. Not that any of our politicians on both sides of the aisle have been in the news for being vulgar recently, right? But we can explain all that away as me just being my authentic self. I just, it is who I am, I tell it like it is. Or it's just morally lazy. That there isn't a higher ideal by which we are to live by. We live in a world, in a culture, that philosophically has shifted so far into this Rousseau approach to life that what we've created and what we're living in is an incredibly narcissistic, individualistic culture. A narcissistic, individualistic culture where we're offended by everything. And we have no ability to persevere through something that is difficult. One of the greatest complaints among college professors today, there's a recent article in USA Today about this, is that college students today have no grit. That when, now, don't be yeah, those millennials, let's, let's attack them. I'm not saying that, it's, just, it's, it's the outcome of the culture in which we live. That we lack grit, because when things get hard, it's just so easy to cut and run, to go on to the next new thing. And we, we selfishly and narcissistically believe that the next new thing will be the thing that brings us joy. And what we end up in, what we end up in is that our joy is so affected by the world around us and the circumstances that we're in. Now, if you're under the age of 45 or 40, you've been conditioned more in a Rousseau approach to life than you have an Aristotle approach to life. It doesn't mean that this is a broad brush stroke and everybody falls into these categories. It just means that's the culture, cultural shift that we've experienced. And what's happening is we're ending up in this joyless culture. That's the irony of all of it. That we've been taught in condition that if we find the real authentic self, then we will be happy. Then we will find joy. But all it does is make everything and everyone around us responsible for our joy. Aristotle's approach to that is not much different, by the way. It gives us the same outcome. That everything and everyone is responsible for me being happy. And so our circumstances around us affect our joy. And I think most of us could look at our lives, take a step back, and go, yeah, that's, that's actually true. So what does that mean for us as Christians when, when we are to be people who live by the Spirit and are to live with joy? If our joy is, is so easily taken, so easily distracted by the circumstances around us, then what does it mean for us to be people with joy in the world? And what does it mean for us to be joy givers? The book of James is not something that any prosperity gospel preacher will ever turn to. James begins his letter to the 12 tribes of Israel. To the 12 tribes. So he's, he's writing to Jewish Christians. And he just goes right to it. He doesn't say, you know, he's, it, what's, like I have this image. He's not a pastor in like skinny jeans. He's like, isn't Jesus awesome? You know, uh, he just kind of goes right at it. He belongs to Jesus. Oh, by the way, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 
So to me, as, as James is writing this letter, that's his, that's his opening. Does that make you go like, yeah, sure, I want to read this, right? That's his opening line to the church. Consider it pure joy. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, it, it sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? Like, I'm sure you're not all coming here to church this morning so that I can tell you that following Jesus means that everything's going to be terrible and you're going to face all kinds of trials, right? Generally, that's not the reason why we signed up to follow Jesus or why we signed up to belong to the church. But you know what? In the first century, it was. James is the brother of Jesus. It's most likely the year 60, 64, somewhere in there. And to be a Christian at that point was radically different than the world around you. To be a Christian in the first century meant that you were rejecting the culture by which you lived in. And it most likely meant that you were going to be persecuted. James doesn't come with a promise that if you follow Jesus, God is going to give you all of the things your heart desires. James doesn't promise to the church that if you follow Jesus, all will be well and you'll never run into conflict and everybody's just going to get along and sing kumbaya. That is not the promise. James says to the church, consider it joy, my friends. Consider your trials and consider your persecution. Consider your struggles. Consider all of those things that you're in joy. That is weird. Isn't it? Are you saying, do we believe that we should look at the struggles we're in in our lives and consider those joy? Because that's what James is saying. Think about where you might find yourself in a situation or something in your life that is sucking your joy. Because James is saying you should consider it. Maybe you're in a battle for your health, your life. Consider it joy. Maybe you're in a battle to save your marriage. Consider it joy. Maybe you're in a secret battle, one against addiction or mental health. And James is saying, consider these things joy. Doesn't sound like joy, does it? So how could we, as the church, consider these things joyful? How could we bear the fruit of the kingdom and the fruit of the Spirit with joy when we find ourselves in trials? And the answer is, is simpler than we might think or might want to admit. For Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross and its shame and scorn. The joy set before him. Prior to Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross, and even after it, no person from the first century or before would walk into our churches and think, well, those are beautiful crosses. See, the cross itself was a symbol of Roman power and Roman authority. The cross itself was a symbol of shame. And for Jewish people in the first century, to die at the hands of the cross was the worst possible death you could die. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus...